going to be led by Eric Savitz of Forbes. Uh, so stay, uh, stay, uh, stay tuned for a very uh, stimulating, exciting discussion. I know with Eric moderating this next panel, it'll sure be very lively and controversial. So Eric, uh, why don't you come up? And, uh, and David Chun from Vance Info, uh, David Lamb from West Summit Capital, David Williams from William Capital Advisors. Do we have any other Davids around? Uh, and also Valerie Leon from Asia Alternatives. Uh, this panel is about uh, making the deal. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, of um, we're seeing a slowdown in IPOs and a pickup in going private. We're also seeing an uptick in uh, M&A and trade sales. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, Eric uh, take it away from here. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, sir. Uh, yeah. I can just yell. That'll work. I can just say David. I can just say David a lot, and someone will yeah, answer me. Yeah, David a lot. I actually, why don't you all scoot down one one oh, extra, sure. so so the podium doesn't hide hide their view here. Okay. Is that better for the people over here? There we okay. Go. Good. Okay. There we go. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to think of a, a strategy here for how to say David and not know who the hell I'm talking to. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about the sort of state of the, uh, 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 state of the market for uh, Chinese um, uh, IPOs. And um, let's, let's start with David. We'll talk with David Williams. David, could you give us a little sense as, uh, from an, an investment banker's perspective, how do things look right now? Sure. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, the uh, the overall perception of investor interest in Chinese IPOs, it looks pretty glum, at least when you're, you know, looking at the press. But over the last couple of weeks, we've surveyed quite a few hedge funds and other investors, and they're still quite interested in uh, in the China market. Uh, but it's selective interest, and so they're not scared away by all the scandals and all the uh, wars with the short sellers and what have you. In fact, some of these investors are short sellers. Uh, what they're looking for are the companies that are growing fast enough to uh, to uh, more than offset the the perceived risk discount required for investing in China. And um, in particular, there are a number of sectors that are growing faster than the overall Chinese economy, and therefore they're less concerned about investing given that uh, whether the Chinese economy grows at 8% or 6% or what have you, these companies still should be able to uh, you know, earn their way uh, to premium valuations. So, so um, let's just take a minute to look backwards at how we ended up with a market where it is so difficult right now. Not what's well, difficult for anybody to come public, uh, but particularly true for Chinese, um, uh, for Chinese internet companies uh, in the U.S. market. How did we end up with such a difficult, uh, a difficult market? Uh, sure, uh, I would say there are a number of problems. One. One, which I think we talked about earlier, is all the backdoor listings that happened. And so uh, a high percentage of them had problems with the underlying companies being merged into the shells. And they were uh, ripe for the picking for the short sellers. And so uh, with the success the short sellers had in shorting those companies and uncovering problems, uh, they had a great deal of credibility. And then when they moved on to the already public companies that had gone through the traditional process of listing in the United States, uh, Wherever there was smoke, there was a soon to be fire. And so they were able to drive down the prices of many companies that, uh, that were uh, quite good companies that had no problems. And so when you look to uh, new companies looking to list right now, I wouldn't say that the challenges are meaningfully higher than they were uh, a year ago. Um, but you have to overcome some issues that have arisen in the last one to two years. And those relate to issues such as quality of auditing, um, growth of the overall economy, and then issues regarding structuring. And so uh, investors are still wi willing to invest in Chinese companies with the VIE structure, uh, you know, which is indirect ownership. But the devil's in the details. And Baidu is often looked at as uh, the gold star example for how to structure a VIE. And then there are companies, which I won't mention, which might be viewed as the opposite of that. <laughs> so. Um <laughs> I'm going to keep saying David and make myself laugh. <laughs> um, David Lamb, could you talk a little bit about um, how uh, your approach to the market has or hasn't been affected 
um, in terms of invest, investing in, in the venture capital market in China, um, but, and how that's been affected by the, uh, the change in, in the available exits for you? Yeah, I think specifically related to IPOs, what, uh, so just a little bit of background on, on, on our firm. We invest in both, both foreign companies, so companies, in, for instance, in the U.S. or in Silicon Valley, that have products uh, ready for the China market, and we help those bring those companies in their growth stage of financing into China. Likewise, we are an active investor in China in the growth stage uh, market there. Um, I would say that it's, it's actually impacted our investment approach um, quite substantially. Our uh, general assumption when we look at investments in the U.S. is that they would go public or they would exit in the U.S. Um, our expectation for Chinese companies, likewise, is that they would exit in China. So we have stayed away from some of the um, structures that we've talked about t tonight um, and, and really focused on companies that, if, if they're successful, will stay within that, within that country uh, to really avoid um, some of the potential issues that may happen. You know, we're, we're by no means um, uh, experts in, the, in this field, so, so we don't consider ourselves uh, you know, able to predict when the market sentiment about China, which I think some of it is unfounded, um, but, uh, but nonetheless is there. Uh, we're not sure when that sentiment will change. So f in, in the meantime, uh, all of our investments are really structured to, uh, to exit in their respective home markets. So w what's the, uh, talk a little bit more though about the, uh, the advantage of uh, and why you're thinking about that that way about it, it exiting in your home market? Why you want it? Uh, because there's been a pers I mean, there's been I don't know what the, the current number of Chinese uh, companies listed in the U.S. is, but it's a very large number. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you're you you're thinking as they should exit in, in well, China. Well, I think generally it's it's all about for us it's a, it's all about valuation. So we we see that. Uh, Chinese companies that are listed in the U.S. typically have a pretty low valuation. In fact, we've looked at some take private opportunities uh, over the last uh, several months because we see that as a huge buying opportunity. As far as a selling opportunity, we're, we're much more cautious in terms of our growth stage companies in China that may have an opportunity to go public down the road. So we've really, uh, you know, we, we've really focused on, 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 on those companies staying within their home markets. And, and, and I think it, you know, it really has to do um, you know, as, as well with, with just our, you know, our general belief um, and, and our experience. Two of our co-founders started ch companies uh, or took companies public that were Chinese companies uh, and took them public on NASDAQ. So they have a little bit of personal experience with this as well. And I think, again, uh, you know, our, our collective perspective is to really um, steer clear of those, um, those companies and, and those sectors that, that would force them to go public on the U.S. markets to achieve liquidity. So, um, David, <laughs> um, you're running a company, David, this, David, David number three, okay. David Chen. Um, you're running a company that is that has done exactly what he was describing. You're a uh, you're a China-based uh, infrastructure IT infrastructure provider. Mm -hmm. You are listed in in the, in the U.S. Uh, you're about to merge with another Chinese infrastructure provider that is also listed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about your experience. Um, no, you've been public for quite a while now, so it's a different, slightly different time frame. But talk about the dis, uh, your ex, your experience as a U.S. listed China-based company and the advantages or disadvantages of being listed here rather than in China. Okay. Yeah. Back then, when we raised money from Silicon Valley VC, Sequoia Capital, TCM, I think they have given us a lot of support and also, I mean, established a good governance structure for our company early on. So that's a lay a very strong foundation for us. And also, back then, the only choices for us to go public is still in the U.S. That, that, that's pretty much it, the only choices. And then luckily, in 2007, even though the economy is still already slowing down in the U.S., but we still <coughs> made the right choice. We, we decided to still go public. And then we have seen the up and downs. Basically, when we went public, we thought we can price as uh, 12 to $15. But eventually, the offering price, the, we went public on December 12, 2007. Oh. Right, so <laughs> eventually the offering price was 8.5, right? So mm -hmm. the board delegated the whole decision making to the management team. Management said that we still want to go public because, I mean, our business majority of them are from, from the global market. So in order to raise the visibility of, of potential customers or the, the market we are tackling, it makes a lot of sense to go public. And then at one time, our stock went all the way down to $4. And then eventually, because we deliver consistent result quarter by quarter, it went all the way up to the $40. Mm -hmm. And then because of the, the long-top scandal, all the kinds of the economic issues, et cetera, 
And then our stock eventually came down to seven to eight, ten dollar right now. So we have seen those up and downs. But talking about the, what's the current assessment of uh, being public or being private or whatever, I think we, we did a lot of thinking on these areas because uh, one of the choice for us is we take a company private, right? I mean, try to do our own and let's see what would be the best exit. The other so one so when, you, when you get down to, when you, your, your stock goes to $4 from 850 are, are you, is that a time when you, you begin to think, wow, you, um, stock's cheap, we should, maybe we should buy the whole thing? No, actually, back then, four dollar. Even though we were at the four dollar, but I think we still need to consistently deliver the result because we haven't proved ourselves in a mm -hmm. public market. So we we think, give us some time to prove ourselves, and then eventually the stock price will eventually reflect our mm -hmm. internal value. Yeah, um, but the, let's say for the last year, we do have option. Let's say we, whether we want to go public or, we, I mean, we still continue as a public company, or we, we can take the comp company private. Uh, or we merge with another one, right? Mm -hmm. So I think because the nature of a company, the, the strategic direction for our company is try to be the next generation global services companies. And if we take our company private and then try to go public, let's say in Hong Kong stock market, then it still limit our, um, the future, uh, the vision. It doesn't reflect the vision for our company. So the current thinking for us is that we, we as everyone, Probably many people already in this room know about it. We will merge with Highsoft, another leading IT services company out of China, uh, another public company actually also. So the whole process was very cumbersome. Before announcement, I mean, we had a number of board meetings, right? The, the, our lawyer, right. he mm -hmm. came, I mean, flew all the way from San Francisco, sitting in every board meetings. And every board meeting, he had to remind us, I mean, what would be the responsibility as a board member, right? But I think we, we made the right decision for shareholder, for all the employees in our company. We, we merged the two companies we, so that we can shorten the time that we reach the key milestone, one billion dollar revenues, mm -hmm. so that we can compete on global basis. And also we have a much deeper management bench so that it enable us to, to grow our capabilities. Um, and then we also need to take time, actually, four to six quarters after the transaction to prove that we can really um, uh, deliver the result, drive cost synergies and revenue <coughs> synergies. And then for us, I, mean, I know that the Chinese concept has a lot of troubles these days, um, but I think there are some of the companies are sort of like penalized because of their, some bad apples. Yeah. Um, for us, we also try to move up beyond the China concept because um, ideally we are truly global company. Today, after the combined company, one third of business from Greater China, and then 40% revenue is from US based customers. 10% is from European-based customers, and the rest is from Asia, and Asia is the fast-growing sector for us. We're doing business in ASEAN countries like Thailand, <coughs> Burma, Indonesia, Singapore, et cetera, and also expanding quickly in Australia market. Uh, it's, a, it's a gold mine, actually, for us. So I think we see a tremendous opportunity ahead of us, so we'd like to move beyond the China concept for us. But uh, after six quarters, we will definitely we'll continue to evaluate different options. Yeah, I mean, do the best thing for the shareholders. So, so one thing I'm curious about uh, for your company is um, a, a lot of the discussion around Chinese technology companies has been around um, web companies. And a lot of those are consumer facing, search engines, mm -hmm. online commerce companies like that. In your case, it's a different story. You're serving enterprise customers. I wonder if in your case, having a US stock listing um, is, uh, is an advantage in the sense that your and your customers are probably a little more conscien conscious of things like your corporate structure in, in a way where if I'm using, if I'm going to do a search on Baidu, I'm not thinking about who owns the company particularly, I don't think. Mm. Is that helpful for you to be listed here? I think it definitely would be very helpful because for us even to expand the business, ironically we, we start from a global business and then we came back to China business, domestic business, and we become the, one of the largest IT services provider for the domestic banking sectors, the airline sectors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Because I think as a globally, globally listed company, I think it gives us a lot of, um, it automatically establish a lot of trust relationship with our customers. Mm -hmm. And then it's also helped a lot for us to expand our footprint throughout Asia and also be able to attract global talents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think still it's a good thing, but uh, maybe 
people just not satisfied with the stock price, right? It doesn't reflect, I mean, to me also, personal view, it doesn't reflect the intrinsic value, yeah. Do, do you think if you look at the valuation of your stock relative to, the, say, you know, the Accentures and IBMs of the world, the companies that you compete with, or do you get penalized um, as a Chinese domicile company as opposed to being, say, based in, you know, New York or something? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You mean when we compete against? Yeah. Them? Well, in in terms of the way the investment community evaluates you. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. It's all. De it depends on the market we are targeting. Okay, for Chinese market, it's considered to be home turf today. Right. So automatically we have. Uh, advantage because we, team, we home, keep home field advantage. We, yeah, we keep gaining market share against all the other competitors, local competitors, global competitors. Mm -hmm. In fact, for the combined company, we do about $120 million just for the Chinese banking sectors. Mm -hmm. So automatically put us as number one, I mean, dominant number one. And then, but for the Asia countries, we also has a lot of competitive advantage. We compete against um, IBM, Accenture, Cognizant, and Infosys throughout Asia, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we still have a lot of value can, can be provided to the customers. Um, and that's why we, we, are, we, we gain accounts like Air Asia in Malaysia, we, we work with uh, Telstra in Australia, etc. Mm -hmm. we, we can effectively compete. I think, but the, for the long last standing market that we are uh, serving, North America, European market, we definitely can do a good job for them for, the, for their operation in Asia. I'll give you an example, New York University, right? I mean, they are expanding. They're going to build a huge campus in Shanghai. Right. So who's going to the best service provider for them? Definitely Wednesday <laughs> for <yeah. laughs> Similarly for no Staples, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Similarly for Staple, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a Boston-based uh, 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 office supply company, and they bought a company in China, and they tried to grow uh, aggressively in China and then move to the e-commerce platform. So they can work with... Uh, IBM Accenture or I, uh, Fancy Info, but because of our unique strengths, we have a lot of developers throughout China. We have a lot of, we know that we have the very intimate knowledge, uh, knowledge on the cutting edge technologies. Uh, also, we have the reliable processes and methodologies. So we were chosen to serve Good. them, yeah. But uh, we need to take a fresh look at how to really expand eventually to the global markets and also try to be more inno innovative, try to attract, be able to attract, attract different, different talents mm -hmm. to truly form a global kind, and that's still a challenge for us. Uh, uh, Valerie, I, I, we've neglected you down there. Um, because your name is not David, so we're going we're to call you David. So David on the end, newly named David. Um, Talk a little bit about, so your firm, you, you, run, you work at a, head, a fund of funds uh, that you do private equity and venture capital and all sorts of things. Talk a little bit about your perceptions about the state of the Chinese, um, not just IPO market, but sort of equity markets and how, you, how, that per, how your perceptions of the markets affect where you allocate capital. Sure. Um, so in terms of the, in terms of the venture market, um, I'll start there. What we're seeing, our, our very first commitment was actually to an early stage Chinese venture firm. Um, and what we're seeing in our earlier commitments back um, vintages 05, 06, is there definitely is a slowdown. We did expect to see more liquidity you know, at this point. Um, so bottom line, there's an IRR impact. But what we're hoping is that from a multiple um, standpoint, ultimately, that there won't be too much of a hit with the, with the overall funds. Mm. Um, so even though the valuations are lower, you know, the, on the, um, domestically the IPO window is shut, uh, we are encouraging our GPs to spend most of their time on the winners in their portfolios. So when the IPO markets domestically do reopen, um, you know, that they will, there will be that strength in the, in the portfolio mm -hmm. um, and still, again, to maintain the multiples. Um, on the public market side, what we've seen is from our growth capital managers in China, they're increasingly... Uh, they're increasingly doing some open market purchases, but mostly pipe transactions. Again, because the because the the valuations are very attractive. So, are you seeing companies go uh, look at? I mean, if you have a company that needs to raise capital, it's relatively matured in a normal environment, might choose to go public, either in the U.S. or China. Are you? What what options are they taking? Are they? You know, did, can they go public in Hong Kong? Can they um, do? You know, later stage. Um, private equity, what are you finding for your, 
those companies know, doing? It's a matter for us. It's a dialogue with our GPs about how to how to maintain the growth. And again, to my earlier comment about focusing on the winners, there are some you know that just can't maintain the growth and also can't raise another round. Um, the the market in Hong Kong has also been extremely tight. So again, I think there's more um, bifurcation within the overall funds, the overall venture funds, as a result. Mm -hmm. David and Liam, what um, what are you doing with, in your case um, with uh, for when you we've got a portfolio of companies that either approaching what you would hope to be exit sized um, um, are looking for ways to either find a find an exit strategy, find a liquidity event, or at least if not perhaps find another way to raise capital. Are they doing uh, like late stage rounds? What what what's the strategy you're playing? In, in China or in the U.S.? In China. <clears throat> I think in, in China, a, a lot of our investment uh, focus there has, has actually been less on the B2C space mm -hmm. uh, for some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been very much focused on companies in the hardware ecosystem. Uh, that's one area of, of keen interest for us. Uh, reason being is that the manufacturing ecosystem for almost any electronics product in the world often runs through China. So we've been quite uh, impressed with a lot of the companies there um, that are uh, really competing against imports, imports from Japan, imports from the U.S., imports from Europe and the like, and taking a cost structure that's very um, uh, sensitive uh, and, and leverages China, as well as a standard that is really at a global standard. So as a result, many of our companies that we have that are in China do have and meet many of the listing requirements for, uh, for, for the China market. Mm -hmm. um, we have one company that's preparing for a listing, uh, for filing in the first quarter of, of, of next year. Um, and so they've been profitable for several years and, and have grown revenues substantially um, over that period of time as well. One of our newer investments is the same thing. They've been profitable for, for you know, three, four years, but uh, have really hit that, hit that inflection point in their growth. So uh, you know, when, when we're looking for, quite frankly, for those companies, we're looking for opportunities to, to invest more. Um, because of the challenges in the, in, the, in the Chinese IPO market, this gives us an opportunity to put additional capital to work. And so, um, and, and since those companies, as I mentioned earlier, are manufacturing real, real things, um, they do require working capital, they do require um, you know, buying new tooling machines and all those sorts of things that, that, that companies need. So, um, so we've, we've uh, used that, that, that opportunity to step in mm -hmm. uh, and, and invest additional capital in, uh, in those companies. When you say you're making real things, um, are you talking about um, in the electronics market or other kinds of yeah, so equipment. so we're very excited about the mobile sector, which was discussed earlier today, um, and and that entire uh, mobile ecosystem uh, for us. You know, we've looked at companies. Uh, really, you know, we, we have an investment already um, in a company in the in the North Flash memory space. That's the. Um, memory that does not require energy to store data, very common in mobile mm -hmm. devices like tablets and phones, um, as well as in a, um, in a z uh, optical zoom subsystem company in uh, southern China, uh, which has um, actually been selected by some Japanese customers, even though uh, they compete very heavily against some of the Japanese uh, lens um, subsystem companies. So, so instances where you're taking, and, and this flash memory company just replaced Spansion, which is, uh, used to be part of AMD, a big U.S. company, uh, as the fourth largest provider in the world for that technology. So, uh, so in those cases, we're looking for companies that are, um, you know, that have that, um, have some technology, but, but also are highly competitive and, and, and face a, an international host of, of, of uh, competitors. And, and also some, some of our, um, uh, partners have have been involved in in various companies that are uh, pretty that are important um, parts of the ecosystem in the mobile space. So, uh, so that's where we focus more on uh, on the uh, on the software side. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of our investing has been here in in Silicon Valley because we see we do see right now a huge gap between uh, some of the the um, the development of the enterprise software business in China compared to what you might see in, in Silicon Valley. So, you know, companies like David's are going to be very successful because they have um, they have Western DNA that's really driving their innovation. Likewise, uh, we see opportunities for U.S. companies to expand out there. Um, and so, and so, in those cases, you know, we're, we're that that's really defines our software strategy. Are there are there examples of Chinese enterprise software companies that have managed to become 
you know, significant players outside the domestic market? That's a good question for David. <laughs> um, I, I think on the service side, we are living example, right? right? So we are already expanding um, in multiple markets. But on the software front, actually, it's very tough because even I mean, internally, we said that we are going to move to the Nanini, Nanini model means we need to build a software upfront and also either licensing the software to the customer or doing an SSS model, right? Mm. But even for the Israel companies, they, when they move to the US market, they pretend as American company like Mercury Interactive Commerce or uh, MDOG, all those companies. Right. Right? They've done very successful, I mean. Um, and then very few companies from the other part of the world, um, like a Germ, uh, German based, uh, Germany based SAP or a business object from, from France, I mean, they've been successful. So we are thinking about how we are able to do it. Um, that's a big question mark for us to answer also. I, I don't know yet, actually. But uh, we, we have our own airline solution, productized software. Mm -hmm. We've been successfully selling to ASEAN countries in Burma, in, in, in uh, Macau. Macau mm -hmm. is part of China, but uh, it's still very independent. Yeah. In other parts of the ASEAN country, we are actively selling our productized solutions. And those emerging co companies, actually, they are very um, Acceptive to 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 Chinese uh, solutions actually, because I think China probably will be a very good testing ground because uh, you have the a lot of affluent customers and also you have extremely poor customers, so you can test all kinds of softwares. And also with the merging of the B to B to B to C, because mm -hmm. uh, I think the consumerization IT is going to create a huge impact to the enterprise computing. And then this morning I also had a discussion with uh, one of the. Um, former PwC uh, partner, he, he's retiring and now he's writing a book about the social enterprise computing. I, I, I totally agree his, I mean, he's thinking that enterprise 1.0 one or 2.0, it's all about um, how to take the, align with the company's strategic visions and then also take an order from the top executive and implement mm -hmm. the systems. But uh, you can see the grassroots movement of the enterprise computing, Yammer or those companies, Right, they acquire customers just like internet companies and try to convert those customers into paying customers, yeah. So I think you're going to see a lot of, put the human face on the enterprise computing and then uh, it's, it's similar to like Renaissance in the uh, middle of Asia. <laughs> right. <laughs> so for the enterprise computing. Right. So, so I think it's the big wave is coming. Uh, I think there are tremendous opportunities over there and how we're going to write on those trends um, uh, we hope we can do something about it and mm -hmm. try to create a global impact. Yeah. So I, I want to raise one, uh, one of the questions that gets raised a lot as uh, U.S. investors look at investing in Chinese uh, companies, even U.S. listed Chinese companies, is concerns about um, uh, things like regulation and accounting standards. And they, there's a sort of an underlying, I think when you look at, say, sort of valuations and look at perhaps in some cases why maybe those companies don't get the same valuations that you do for a U.S. domiciled company, that there's concerns about um, the, uh, the quality, say, of regulation and accounting standards and their just ability to have transparency on what's actually happening at companies based in China. I wonder if somebody, maybe uh, I'll let you, I'll throw it open, looking for, just for some insights on whether that's a legitimate concern, is that over an overstated Fear is, or is there a good reason to be concerned about that issue? David? <laughs> and I was just asking anybody, David. David. Anybody named David. Go ahead, David Williams. Okay. Um, I, I'd say it's, it's not over. Uh, there should be some level of concern, right? But um, it, it ebbs and it flows to extreme degrees in China. And so when I, when I first moved out there in 97, uh, and I was with Solomon Brothers, there was an attitude, I remember when we were trying to uh, take uh, a few internet-related companies public in the U.S. out of India and China, and the reaction we got back in New York was, no way in hell, this isn't <laughs> going to work. The only place that they do tech in Asia is in Taiwan, and it's dirty in Asia, and all sorts of things that made no sense like that. Right? And, and they said, if you can take a company public, you've got to do it at a discount to the U.S. comparable because of the risk in China, the country risk. But they failed to, to factor in the fact that if you've got a Chinese company that's growing at three or four times the rate of the U.S. company, you don't value it at a discount. It happened many times, but then those companies rocketed up two or three, two or three X within a year or perhaps the same day. So what you need to do is 
value it based on a growth adjusted multiple and then subtract the discount. And generally the discount, we track it by looking at Baidu versus Google as one example. Mm -hmm. The discount has ranged from uh, as low as a negative discount where it looked like the US was riskier during the financial crisis to a 20% discount for China. But, but in any event, it swings back and forth. And right now we're at the bottom, the, you know, the worst that it can be. And uh, you know, I'd say that valuations right now, yeah, they're lower uh, on average for US listed Asian companies, but that's temporary. And if you look back over the last 10 to 12 years, it swings radically up and down. And so once we get going a little further along, and I think we've hit the bottom in terms of the scandals in China, you're gonna see US, not just US institutions piling back into these stocks, the ones that are already listed in the US or high quality IPOs, the ones with the right type of structures which don't allow for easy manipulation of profits by management. Um, and then you're going to see retail investors pour in again, like you, ha you do every time we have a cycle. And so within a few years, you're going to be seeing much higher valuations here in the U.S. And so it, it, right now, you know, I, I think uh, David Lamb's point was correct, that right now valuations are tougher here. But in a few years' time, it, it'll probably swing way too far in the other direction. And it's just a question of, you know, it, when you have to do a transaction or whether you want to be on that ride. Boom to bust. Valerie, what's your thought about this? Sure. Um, well, wearing the LP hat, I mean, it's one, one glaring reason why we, we believe it's so important to be local. Um, you know, and when we're diligencing GPs, um, we prefer single country fund managers, again, because they're the ones that know the ins and outs of the markets um, and conduct that deep due diligence Right, that takes away some of the um, concerns that some of our investors have about the lack of transparency. I mean, I absolutely agree. We're at a very low point, um, you know, and you and sentiment comes in cycles. And when we're at a low point, that's also a good time to seek opportunity. So, oh, Rebecca, how are we doing on time? Are you over there? I can't see you. We have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, do you have any? Questions in the audience before we keep going? Um, yeah. Oh, we have a mic. We have a mic coming over. Take that. Okay. You're on the spot, David. I'll make it easy. Uh, for the first time in a number of years, if someone were to lend me a million dollars, okay, full recourse to myself. Anybody want to lend David a million dollars? <laughs> do, 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 we, do we hear too? <laughs> uh, I would invest it in the China market right now. I would not have said that uh, six months ago. I wouldn't have said it two years ago, three years ago. So things look, I mean, I've seen some of the best teams that I, where I know the teams personally and the companies batter down and and so usually you do pay a premium for those companies and when, you, when you say you'd invest in the China market are you talking about you would invest in US listed Chinese equities or you would invest it in private Chinese 
U.S. listed Chinese entities. And the reason for that is that um, I believe that a U.S. listing provides a higher bar, uh, and I'm more comfortable with companies that do that, uh, as long as they have enough market cap to have the research coverage and so on. Um, but when you're considering a listing, you know, to everybody else's point, um, all I would advise is that you set yourself up so that you could consider a U.S. listing or a local listing, depending on your market and so on and the type of company you are. You don't have to go one way or the other, but once listed, I'm much more comfortable with U.S. listed companies. Interesting. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I won't give my money. <laughs> <laughs> so St Stella wants to lend money, huh? <laughs> She's a venture investor here in the audience <laughs> from China. If you want to give her more than a million dollars. Yeah, she, she has more than a million dollars to play with. Uh, I'm, not that, I'm not that confident. I'd go up to two. Oh, really? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so maybe not so doom and gloom after all out there. I think there. we have yes. one more. Uh, Liling? Uh, and uh, just wait for the mic for a second. My name is Wei Ling Ling. I work for a U.S. listed Chinese company. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my question is that well, the U.S. listed Chinese companies are way down, stock valuation is way down. But the Chinese stock market is also way down. So is that out of the uh, sink? What, what, what are your opinions about it? Well, Chinese listed companies, China listed. I'm happy to answer, but uh, to give everybody else a chance, do you want to, somebody else um, want to go? David Lamb? Go ahead, David. Okay. Um, the, 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 the problem with comparing the two, if you look at the China markets, is that um, if you look back a year or two, a lot of people were saying, look at the great valuations in the China market. Well, to some extent, some of those markets are closed, right? Sometimes there isn't as much liquidity, as much trading volume. And so it's really hard to compare the two. Um, I, I'd say that uh, generally, uh, generally, the uh, the China market right now, you're seeing uh, individual investors there dealing with for the first time in a long time uh, a decreasing uh, growth rate. Right, and it's not the growth rate that matters; it's the the growth of the growth rate. Right, that freaks people out. Um, so uh, I would say that it's also depressed. There's probably upside there as well. Um, but, but once again, I, I, I just am more comfortable knowing that the companies have to do more reporting and are generally up, so signing up for something, uh, you know, for, for a higher bar of, of uh, governance. Um, and therefore, I, I believe that there's certainty that the U.S. listed China companies are going to rise a good deal over the last, next couple of years. The Chinese companies will rise too. but. They could rise a lot less. They could rise a lot more, depending on individual investor sentiment in China. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I'm Maggie Young from Bank of America Fire uh, I would like to you know, share a few of my thoughts on how I would invest on my client. Okay. okay. And also a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my view is, how far can we go down if the valuation and the fundamental are so attractive? I mean, I think the companies are trading low for value. Okay, so, but then, how, when will it go up? I have been going to the average trade down in the past maybe eight months. It's still flat. I would say maybe it is a matter of, because the confidence is not bad. Once the confidence is back, a different story will go down. And I do believe in fundamentally, but sometimes it's just stretched too long. It becomes valid for just a little bit too long. People get tired and exhausted, you know. Many of my clients are good in it. You know, how come I do believe that, yes, it's very inexpensive right now in China. How I look at it is, how far can it still go down? All these companies are doing so good the sales. You know, now how can it go another 50%? Okay, so who wants to take the... Yeah, so... Yeah, 
It, I, I realize that's sort of a rhetorical question, but did anybody want to respond to that? I should have studied psychology and not engineering it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, the, for the companies that are uh, in trouble, and legitimately so, I think that it is very possible for them to continue to drop. I think that to uh, Valerie's point earlier, if you have uh, if you have a local team that understands out of those 300 or so Chinese companies that are listed on NASDAQ or on foreign exchanges, which ones are the best ones to invest in, I think then you follow, uh, you know, you follow David's guidance and find those companies and invest in them. In our case, try to take them private. In, in, in your case, put your clients in those companies. Um, because I think if you follow that rule, then, then when market sentiment does change, and it's anyone's guess when that might happen, uh, then, then you'll see this flip just as it has historically back to the positive. Um, you know, what we've done is just from a conservative basis, been um, assumed in our analysis, internal analysis, for our internal, uh, for our investment discussions, that only Chinese companies we will uh, we will assess an opportunity to go public in China, and likewise for U.S. Um, but we would love for there to be more options, um, and and we, I personally hope that day comes soon. But it's I, I can't predict when that might happen. Well, and I think you can't ignore that there there are macro concerns, right? So if you're mm -hmm. if you're concerned about the growth rate um, on a macro basis in China. Um, it becomes beyond, I mean, there are obviously valuation questions, but then if you have a, you know, broader macro concerns about China or the other markets that these companies are serving, um, that will figure into the equation. And of course, anything that's not trading, trading at zero can go lower. Look at, uh, you know, research in motion. So. Um, there's, al <laughs> there's always lower, yeah. Well, Eric's writing about the, these stocks every day. If you follow Eric on Forbes at Forbes.com, he often posts as many as 10 times a day. I don't know how he does it. That's a but slow day. That, that's <laughs> a slow day, he says. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, follow, follow Eric on Forbes if you really want to know what's going on in the stock market. Um, so uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you, the three Davids, David Williams, David Lamb, David Chen, and Valerie Leong. Thank you Thanks very much. much. What is the innovation? I feel very confident. Found out that anyone that had a really interesting idea usable for everybody. So finding the fit is very important. Doing things the right way. Here, new partnerships, new licensing, new investments. In place. Innovation Dialogue. East meets West in Silicon Valley.